here it is, our second Jane Eyre movie. This one is from 20th Century Fox in 1944 or 1943, as I've seen it listed in some places, uh, with a running time of 94 minutes. This is the restored version that we watched. We own this. Uh, this came with a couple of picture postcards, which was a thing that Fox has been doing with their old movies. Uh, so, a couple notable things about this one from the credits. Uh, besides the rather impressive list of supporting actors, uh, it also has a screenplay by Aldous Huxley of Brave New World fame and music by Bernard Herrmann, who has done a whole bunch of stuff. Now, this was the first version of Jane Eyre that I ever saw, and I think my mom said it was the first version she saw, and my dad said it was the first, first version he saw, and he has seen a lot, trust me. So, uh, it's funny, when we started watching this, I was amazed, uh, it's been a while since I saw it, and the first impressions really stick. Like, we start watching, and there's Brocklehurst, and Mrs. Reed, and Young Jane, and I'm like, yeah, I remember this. Th these are the impressions that I had of these characters for a long time. This stars Joan Fontaine as Jane. Uh, I kind of would like to have seen how Joan Fontaine played young Jane because in The Constant Nymph from 1943 and Letter from an Unknown Woman which was a couple of years later uh, she played a young girl young teenage girl and I think she did that very well and it would have been interesting to see her play a ten-year-old but uh, Joan Fontaine's other parts like in Rebecca a movie that I highly recommend and suspicion and a bunch of other things it, it's like she's made for this kind of part this young naive ingenue type who comes up against all this trouble and she comes out of it a stronger individual so uh so there's her and then there's orson wells as rochester uh i know orson wells is kind of well he's certainly not as controversial as he used to be but he, some people love him, some people think, what's the big deal? I'm one of those people that likes Citizen Kane, and I enjoy watching it. I think he was a really innovative director. Well, for the longest time, this was the only Rochester that I knew, so there's that nostalgic thing to it. Uh, I think they did some weird things to him in this movie. For one thing, he's got this crazy Heathcliff hair, and they put some really, really heavy makeup on him. Uh, probably to make him look tan in the book, he's supposed to be dark, uh, almost brown, like a Spanish descent thing, which is a thing that's very common in the book. It's, it's a little bit off-putting. It wasn't when I was a little kid, but since then I've seen him in so many things that now I'm like, that's, that's not what he looks like. Uh, it sounds like some of his lines have been dubbed, and... Uh, Wells was known for having overlapping dialogue and just talking really fast. I wonder if people on the set were like, Ah, uh, Orson, can can you just say your lines again? We didn't catch them. Because he kind of seems like he's mumbling or just talking too fast with his mouth and his mouth all the way. And you can hear like the transition between it being on there and it being dubbed over. So it's weird, but I think the speed works, especially in so many conversations. Rochester is kind of talking circles around Jane, and they have this banter. And to have someone who is good at that really helps move those things along. Uh, so much of it, their relationship is conversation based. And if you have someone who's just going to draw out everything, it's going to take away from it. Uh, and people liked it, I would say, because Wells did the radio version of Jane Eyre and played Rochester many times. No gypsy scene in this movie, which of course disappoints me because that's one of my favorite scenes. And I think it would have been really cool. Just like seeing Joan Fontaine playing a 10-year-old Jane, uh, it would have been cool to see Orson Welles cross-dressing. I don't know. Moving on. Um... The height difference between them is really good, like physically they look right. You know, he's towering over her and they give him like this Shakespearean prop of a coat thing to wear and it just makes him look big and kind of brutish and you know, she's like a wastrel. Just the way they play off each other I like. Um, I've seen it done 
I don't want to say better, but it just, there are other pairs that have done different things with it, and I don't know, that's why I enjoy watching so many different versions of this story, because you get different stuff, and I enjoy the dynamic in the Jane and Rochester relationship so much that I want to see different people play it out over and over and over again, just to see what nuances they add, and you know, how a different pair's chemistry might change things. Major differences in this version compared to the book. There is no Sinjin Rivers thing, Diana and... Oh, what's her name? I see, I can't even remember. That's terrible. Um, that is all taken out. Instead, we have this composite character, Dr. Rivers, who, uh... I think he's supposed to be, like, a combination of Sinjin Rivers and Miss Temple, the teacher at the school that uh, Jane becomes friends with, and uh, everything that Helen didn't get to say before she died. Uh, and I remembered that there was this nice doctor character, um, but I didn't remember that his place is just kind of cobbled in there and it's weird because not just weird i think it's wrong because he is a friend and a mentor and i don't think it's right for jane to have that kind of person that confidant and that especially that male influence because she's supposed to be all alone she, you know rochester is like the first guy that she's met who was nice to her and to have this other guy that she's been friends with all along, who's not unattractive and not terribly old, uh, it makes it kind of weird. The other thing that is really different is that after the whole thing with the wife comes out uh, and Jane runs away from Thornfield, she's so desperate for a place to stay and food and everything that she goes back to Gateshead. She would never, ever, ever go back to Gateshead. And I just, they take out the visit she makes there, Mrs. Reed calling her and asking her for forgiveness. They take that out and put it all at the end. And so it takes out the fact that Mrs. Reed was asking her to forgive her. It doesn't make sense. And then um, after Mrs. Reed dies, they're selling the house because it, they can't afford to keep it, and it shows her writing to Mr. Brocklehurst and begging for her old job back. And I'm like, okay, strike two here. Like, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have gone back to beg her aunt to let her stay at her house, and she wouldn't beg Mr. Brocklehurst to give her back her job. Like, it just, ugh. And then she hears Rochester's voice and. So, the things that I liked from this movie. The supporting characters, classic. Agnes Moorhead, Henry Daniel, Elizabeth Taylor. They're all... They're all doing the thing. Classic. Uh, I especially like Young Jane's... I, I can't remember what Young Jane's name is. But she is... I like her. She does a good job. And she helps make the transition from young to adult very believable, um, which is something we didn't see in the 1934 version, uh, and sometimes you don't get it, like the 2006 movie, I have a hard time believing that Georgia Henley grew up to be Ruth Wilson, but we'll get to that later. Uh, there's a full 20 minutes spent on the childhood, which is great. I think it's important to include all that stuff. Um, the script follows the book very closely for the most part, incorporates a lot of the dialogue that Bronte had, and, um, a lot of small things, like Jane's goodbye to Bessie when she's leaving Gateshead to go to Lowood, and, uh, kind of things that you would think were insignificant that you probably don't even remember if you haven't read the book recently. Like, there's a curtain between the dining room and the drawing room, and so when the guests at the party uh come out they sweep back this curtain and, and i was like that's in the book and they put that in there that's so weird um just as a movie it's it's very well made uh the camera angles and 
the dialogue are all conveying relationship information and status information. Um, there are a lot of gothic touches, and it's almost moirish in some places. The use of the shadows and everything really twists the mood. Like, this movie is trying to be spooky. They added some things that were not in the book that I thought really added to it, like the lights on the third floor and um, the door rattling, especially when Jane is tending to Mason's wounds. Um, I really like the whole thing with Bertha shaking the door and Jane getting all freaked out. Um, things that I thought were not so good about this movie, uh, certainly the major differences that just changed aspect of aspects of Jane's character and situation and Rivers being like her best friend. Okay, the thunder, the lightning, and the rain, and the wind and everything was just so... It was excessive, almost to the point of being comical, uh, because they were using it to foreshadow stuff, or to just emphasize the gloom and doom and everything, and it was... It was like, okay, come on, <laughs> oh, you could almost tell when they were going to be doing it, like, um, you know, there's the proposal scene, and yes, uh, Bronte used the weather in her book, of course, any author does, uh, but, um, just the lightning striking the chestnut tree, it just was, like, too much, because, like, He's proposing, and all of a sudden, the wind is just like, and um, it was, it was funny, and that made me feel bad. Uh, another thing, um, Joan Fontaine, she tends to have one facial expression through the latter half of the movie. It's like she's just reacting to all these awful things that are happening to her, but um, she stops showing this independent or rebellious vein and that's too bad because well that's important for jane and now for a quick run of the nitpicky things i've got a list here uh helen gets her curls cut and jane sticks up for her and they have to walk in the rain and that's when helen gets sick that was all an additional thing and adding to like the mythos of Helen Burns, you know, they all got their curls cut in the book. Like, it wasn't just her singled out. Like, it was all of them, and there wasn't any walking in the rain. She was sick already. Was sick enough. Um, the wino at the inn that finds Jane attractive basically tries to offer her a drink and pick her up. Like, um, I don't think you should have people finding Jane attractive. She's supposed to be plain. Blanche is blonde. I know that bothers some people. Rochester argues with Blanche to push her into breaking off their in engagement relationship thing uh and that's in place of the gypsy thing which it, it's functional i still would have preferred to have the whole gypsy thing jane does not protest against rochester's uh spending a whole bunch of money on her which i was like hey you need that like she's they it just kind of squelched some of her independent spirit eh. Um, at the end, Rochester still has both of his hands. Uh, he does have a bad leg and he's blind and he does regain his eyesight, which is very important for the whole redemption thingamajig. Um, oh, this, uh, the ending was too quick and one thing that drove me crazy, it does this thing that a lot of movies from the 30s and 40s and probably even the 50s did. Um, it shows a page from the book. Like, it opens with the book opening. And then it would show a page from the book and Fontaine is reading. But, like, if you actually look, the the text surrounding the highlighted paragraph doesn't make sense. Like, you'll have a one thing that's from Lowood and another thing that's from, uh, she's talking about Rochester. And, and it's like, what? Those are nitpicky things, though. Verdict? It's not the most faithful version ever made, but as I think we're going to find here, there is no single faithful version. It is a close adaptation, especially the script, and considering it has a 94-minute runtime, I think they did a pretty good job. It's a classic movie, and it's got a lot of really good things in it, and despite its faults, I, it's one of my favorite ones to watch still. And, you know, sometimes you don't feel like popping in a four-hour-long movie or an eight-hour-long movie or... 
whatever your favorite thing is. Um, it's one of my favorites. I didn't say it's the favorite. I think it's my mom's favorite. Okay, uh, the next ones we're going to be doing are short ones. Um, TV stuff. There's nothing wrong with all these. What am I doing to my scarf here? Oh my goodness, why doesn't somebody tell me that I'm doing something like that? 